are a lot of misconceptions about the more than a century old labyrinth that is the New York City subway. The bizarre tunnel sends millions zooming down the dark cylindrical passage daily. It's so gargantuan that if you spent years scouring the subways, you still would have not seen every single segment. When riding the subway train underground, you are passing through old ghost stations. And whether you recognize them or not, these unused stations resting rarely to chamber a soul within its enclosure house mainly occasional workers and a plethora of both legendary and forgotten graffiti. Never-used facets of the communal infrastructure have been deserted due to various concerns with the structure's ability to stand the test of time. The confines and the speed of the subway car don't allow many views from the average New Yorker. But strange hobos and adventurers still sneak in today. Seldom do we consider the souls below the city that never sleeps. The brave risk takers delve into the dangerous passages in order to make statements and display their creativity by hitting up spots that are seldom seen by regular art enjoyers, which makes it that much more rich in obscurity. In 1900, Architects Heinz and Lafarge hired Gustavino to help construct City Hall Station, the first part of the then new New York City subway. Gustavino tiles are famous all around New York City. The terminal featured chandeliers, skylights, and a vaulted tile ceiling that was designed by Gustavino. Although elegant, it was never convenient or popular, and after it closed, it became a legendary Manhattan underground relic. A secret of subway buffs and urban spelunkers. It's unique among the RIT stations. As the population of the city increased, as did the need for longer trains. But City Hall's unique design meant it was impractical to lengthen the platform. The new longer trains had center doors on each car, and at City Hall's tight curve, it was dangerous to open them. It closed in 1945 and fares now using the nearby Brooklyn Bridge station, but the track is yet a lot in use for the six train to reverse direction going back to the Bronx. The lower level platform of this station was originally built with the intent of allowing Broadway Line Express trains to continue south of City Hall. The local tracks and the active station above were originally intended to be a terminal, where local trains would be turned and routed back north. This plan changed, however, when it was decided to send the express trains out over Manhattan Bridge. Thus, this lower-level abandoned platform never saw a single passenger train. Instead, it became a convenient place to store trains during off-peak hours, with a third track in the center of the station for turning trains in either direction. South of the station, the tunnel dead ends as the ceiling slopes downward. This stretch of abandoned tunnel is filled with pools of water, and for a long time those pools were covered with dust from the destruction of the World Trade Center on 9-11. The LTV Squad, a New York City group of explorers that are dedicated to government accountability, photography, and history, found the station eerie and devoid of life. But the only way to get there, according to one of their explorers, is jumping into the canal. And you can't tell if workers are looking as there are one-way windows that face the end of the platform. In 2009, 
The South 4th Street abandoned subway station was visited by a group of daredevil artists who covered the cavernous space in paintings and murals. Called the Underbelly Project, it's highly dangerous and illegal to visit yourself, but it's believed to be in South 4th Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Like so many of New York City's abandoned stations, 18th Street met its fate due to the continued development of the subway system. Larger stations were built to accommodate longer trains. The 23rd Street station, proving the nail in this stop's coffin, though it may technically be abandoned, it isn't out of sight or mind. Anyone riding the 4, 5, or 6 line can sneak a glimpse of the graffiti-covered station any day of the year. Myrtle Avenue was a victim of the messy Brooklyn-Manhattan transit line. Serving the line between DeKalb Avenue and Manhattan Bridge, the station had its southbound platform completely removed after the merges and switches there led to transit congestion. Thankfully, the northbound platform still exists and is a fantastic work of art that Q&B commuters can admire. Artist Bill Brand painted 30 images in the station that blend into an animated cartoon when viewed from a moving train. It's his own version of a Zotro, an early stop-motion animation device. By installing 228 painted panels on one side of the abandoned platform and a slitted light box on the other to create a mass tranoscope from northbound B or Q cars leaving DeKalb Avenue station on the express track. Stretching for half a mile from Columbia Street to Bowroom Place and Cobble Hill, the Atlantic Avenue Tunnel claims the distinction of being the world's oldest subway tunnel and once described by Walt Whitman as a passage of archer and like solemnity and darkness. Originally constructed in 1844 to improve street congestion and safety issues, the tunnel was sealed in from 1861 until Brooklyn local Bob Diamond rediscovered it in 1981. Diamond ran tours of the tunnel for the public from 1982 until 2010 when the DOT abruptly canceled his contract of use. Those looking to catch a glimpse of the tunnel can see the barrel vaulted ceiling of the alleged coal room at Brooklyn Heights Speakeasy, Le Boudoir, where parts of the tunnel have also been incorporated into the bathroom. Behind this wall there is more tunnel, and a large metallic object believed to be a locomotive back there. There's all kinds of stories of authorities looking for spies and German bomb makers in it over the decades. The former New York City PR guy threw a tantrum and refused to allow anyone to access the tunnel going so far as to wield the manhole shut. The length of the tunnel continues to go uninspected. In nearly every New York City subway tunnel you'll find at least one emergency exit. The tunnels between 63rd, 72nd, 86th, and 96th Street stations have no emergency exit for much of the route between 72nd and 96th Streets. The two parallel tunnels are only linked by occasional pump rooms between the tracks, which do not provide access to the streets far above. There are hidden exits just beyond each platform, though they are part of the caverns for each station and hidden in utility areas. Beyond the Winfield, a lengthy dark section of tunnel station lays. This abandoned New York City subway spur and station were meant to be the terminal of a subway branch line that was never built. What sets the Winfield apart from some of the other provisions that were built around the subway system is that this location contains a station that was fully tiled and completed. The station is still there at least in part. Half of the island platform is used for storage of signs and supplies, while the rest has been converted to offices and locked supply rooms. The Winfield is one of the largest stretches of abandoned tunnel within the New York City subway systems today. Much of the station area today has been completely rebuilt to accommodate offices and crew locker rooms. The remaining section of the platform is now Scunslayer, according to LTV Squad, a dark place piled with miscellaneous electronic junk. The JMZ platform at Canal Street was closed when the MTA decided to reconfigure the BMT Nassau Street Line in 2004. They took this eastern pair of tracks out of service and reopened the south end of the station so the northbound end of the track could run into the western platform, corresponding to photos taken by the group of NYC Permit Explorers, the LTV squad. There's a long-standing subway entrance down there with an old non-standard token booth left in place, intact covered in orange tile very similar to look like those found at the Broadway 49th Street station, which was renovated with them in 1973. 
see it briefly in The Devil's Advocate with Pacino and Keanu Reeves. LTV Squad explored the urban ruins and assert how that in 2004, the former Queens-bound platforms were closed to the public. They were the only crew actively exploring subway tunnels at the time, and those who occasionally went tunneling didn't know the platforms were being abandoned, so it was an easy win for them to get in first. What they found were platforms left exactly as they were when the last passenger train rolled through. Signs still in place, minimal graffiti. It was closed in 1996 through 7 as part of the station rehab of the complex ahead of the track realignment that allowed for the closure of the uptown layup and active track platform. The downtown layup side was not active during the station rehab, only infrastructure and essential repairs were undertaken. The JMZ complex has a lot of hidden areas too. LTV Bad Guy Joe says that today the station still sits in silence. The last time he tried to visit, the lights were still on, and he could see a strange combination of a seated man reading a paper and a shirtless man wandering around the platform, seemingly bored. It is generally avoided, as weird people and exposure to mold and asbestos could come in your way. There's rumors of motion sensors on the platforms in the doorway. Many say it is one of the creepiest spots you could visit, as the abandoned tunnel creeps tunnel explorers out still. Bad Guy Joe took great measures to take these pictures, dodging trains through the darkness, as there's a very active, busy main line that one must walk to access this area. The fact that LTV Squad went out of their way to allow these photos into the public's hand is generous, and the graffiti that they capture is absolutely enchanting. Some of it hold major weights behind it with stories we shall never know. And they don't need the recognition as their tags live on in a place so hard to access that they are legends and dungeon completionists as far as explorers are concerned. The message is that these metropolitan expeditioners put onto the sacred walls of what is practically New York City's catacombs to taggers everywhere that is the subway system will most likely live on long after America has fallen. LTV Squad's journeys have been extensive and deserve all the approbation and respect that they have garnered and more. This is Harlem Hell Cave, and it's even less suitable for a living existence to linger. It is a two-track, no-clearance tunnel. Between the tracks are two-third rails and subway cars closing in together as it's around a bend. The zone sees a train about every five minutes, and considering the length of tunnel and lack of safety provisions, such as niches to duck into to avoid being pummeled, you have a sickening tunnel here, in Joe's words pictures that he snapped in the brief moments of ruminating in the doom of Harlem Hell Cave. The emergency exit is small as well, and is barely big enough to squeeze a two-man crew in. It's chiseled from bedrock like a cave, and ends with a straight-up ladder into a tiny slot in the wall, and have to climb numerous flights to be reacquainted with the above. Located between Canal Street and Brooklyn Bridge on the Interboro Rapid Transit Line, the Worth Street Station was closed in 1962 during the city's platform lengthening initiative. The Brooklyn Bridge Station platform was extended north instead. Track 61 is a distinct platform beneath the Waldorf Astoria Hotel that permitted people with private rail cars to have them sent straight to the hotel where they could take a private freight elevator to enter the building. Appropriately, the Waldorf was constructed directly above the tracks of the old New York Central Railroad, which connected the city to Chicago and the Midwest tracks. Renowned VIPs who used the entrance include World War I General John J. Pershing, who was the first to use the platform in 1938. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who used the entrance to help conceal his paralysis from the public, and Andy Warhol, who held an underground party on the platform 1965. The street level freight elevator entrance is still situated at 101 by 121 East 49th Street. Positioned a few blocks from the 96th Street Station on the 1, 2, and 3 line, 
the 91st Street Station, a six-track station belonging to the IND line that never opened and remained unused, was another victim of platform extensions. Closing in 1959, you could spot the station today while riding the one train and the two or three if no other trains are in the way. Rider Andre Ackerman got to visit the station and observed. The platform was filled with trash, broken beams, old cardboard, and a litter of foam cups. This wasn't just the detritus of a subway station, but the leftovers of old people. If you happen to ask a commuter traveling between Brooklyn and Queens in 1948 about the existence of the 76th Street Station, only some would say they've seen it with their own eyes. The 76th Street Station was part of an extension of the A-Line to 229th Street in Cambria Heights. Almost a century later, speculations persist that the abandoned terminal never even existed. Both official documentation and hearsay contradict each other. You might be surprised most New York City subway tunnels are devoid of rats. The rats, you see, only live around the station platforms, because that is where the food is. Deeper into the tunnels, where few humans go and less carry their lunches, there's no food to live off of. That is, unless a homeless person has been present. Most of the homeless have been removed from the NYC subway tunnels, but a few still go in and live for a while, and sometimes their trash doesn't get scooped on the way out. This is one such location, which Bad Guy Joe calls the shit track. Removed from service a decade ago, this stub track has been severed at the switch from parallel tracks, creating a long, unused, broken down trackway where a homeless person can set up camp right in the middle of a track and cart in all the garbage they want. Up until the mid-1990s, this emergency exit was known as the condos, leading to a tunnel deep below the streets of the Lower East Side. The exit contained landings and a room that junkies from the streets above called home. The higher levels closest to the street were reserved for those who lived there the longest. Newcomers would have to go deeper down, into the subway tunnel where nooks between the tracks also provided for living space. With so many levels and backwater spaces where one could curl up and sleep off a heroin cloud, it's no surprise how it earned the name. Those days are in the past, however. Today there's nothing left except MTA work equipment as well as walls lined with some very old graffiti tags. Given the fact that the area was populated with so many homeless, the tags you might find here are some of the oldest and most historic in the system. Riders didn't come down here very often, not wanting to have to hop over the homeless just to catch a few tags. In 2004, Bad Guy Joe and a photo blogger set out to get onto the abandoned platform at 63rd Street. The 63rd by Lexington Avenue station on the present day F line contained a set of platforms that was virtually unknown at the time. The station is actually an island platform where the future 2nd Avenue subway would run on one side and the present day F line runs today. The platform had a fairly permanent looking partition running down its length, hiding secrets on the other side. This would need to be a stealthy mission considering the high post 9-11 paranoia setting in amongst law enforcement, so their approach was cautious, and finding a train laid up wasn't entirely unexpected. They went further down the platform and found a makeshift workroom. Apparently the NYPD had left this area, or someone has a weird sense of humor. Someone who frequented it had a thing for Foxy Brown. At the opposite end of the room, someone posted another oddball sign. We moved on to the end of the platform, here we found an open door, with stairs going up. We peered up into the darkness. What was this place? Bad guy Joe wrote. We knew we had to find out, but we had to be very quiet. Just opposite another door was the NYPD post. We could practically hear the officer breathing on the other side of the door. We made our way up, and finding any of this was a huge surprise. It's basically a mirror image of the entrance on the west side of the station, only without tiles, escalators, or elevators. But then there was another surprise, a mysterious long hallway. The long hallway led to a few rooms, all of which were empty. One included a shaftway. Moving back out to the mezzanine area, there were few lights, and the stairs up to the street ended at concrete slabs. Bad guy Joe thinks they've redone it. Looks better. 
The Smith's Dungeon is perhaps one of the hardest NYC subway tunnel locations to crack open. These are just pictures of it from the LTV squad. No one knows where it's at, except a select few. Thanks to the tightening of New York City's budget, there are many lost subway lines that were planned but never built. One of these lost lines is the Fulton Street Line, which was planned to run west under the East River from downtown Brooklyn to Manhattan. And believe it or not, there was even an underwater line planned to run from Brooklyn to Staten Island. The 174th Street Subway Yard is a cavernous space under Washington Heights that is currently used to store sea trains. The subway was originally built by the IND, an ambitious company plotting on building numerous subway routes that never came to fruition. It has been long said that this yard was built as a provision for a subway route that was supposed to go over the George Washington Bridge. It features five tracks, four of which are used to lay up sea trains. The fifth track is too short to fit a full-length subway, and LTV Squad is unsure of why it was built. Coming north from 168th Street, the two center tracks ramp upward, allowing the southbound A tracks to pass underneath. Due to the limited space within this yard, at least one train is often laid up on the yard lead tracks. LTV Squad found two tracks that come to a large cavern with the crossover allowing access to two sets of tracks. The same Smith tag can be found here. The sea honk is strangely referred to in graffiti around the New York City subway system. You've got to look close to really notice it. It's not the most well-known graffiti down there. So what's the sea honk? Mysteries of the subway are best left to the imagination. This is a mystery set of stairs connecting two very separate subway tunnels which were built at very different eras decades apart. Up until the 90s, the tracks in this part of town were a haven for homeless people. These stairs provided another route for the homeless to access the tunnels undetected. It's still locked up, and those anti-homeless gates have proven sturdy over time. In the 70s, it started with someone just writing their name. Recalls New York graffiti artist Nicer, born Hector Nazario. Someone saw that and added on to it. The subways became their playground. Many legendary artists made their beginning in graffiti art, such as Jean-Michel Basquiat. During a conversation with this friend, who also had Puerto Rican heritage, they created their signature tag, Samo, after shortening the saying that they have been smoking the Samo crap. The inside joke spread onto the street of downtown Manhattan and became something different entirely. The phrases made with the Samo trademark would sometimes be surreal fragments of what seems to be poetry, but it had a kind of carnal wit behind its simplicity. Making jokes of corporate and downright dystopian realities, the graffiti recognized extremely important principles and ideas, with a tinge of denying the broken corruption of society and breathing its own message, however diluted it may appear. It gave the New Yorkers strolling along the sidewalks and subways something to really think about. Bombing, as several call it, is going back to a kind of communication that is primitive and real, and many claim that this kind of going back to the roots led to breakdancing and rap. They were on to something, and many kinds of people were wanting to be involved. One of these artists was Keith Haring, but he was afraid of taking up the torch and feared that he would steal the minority's attention that were blowing up for the first time. During a time where they were looked down upon in the art world, graffiti was considered a low art form, commonly condemned from the inner circles. Keith Haring's style was different though. He utilized graffiti in his work but it was primarily his chalk murals on black empty advertisement spaces in the New York City subways that captivated his audience. Making political messages and undermining the system, he would create graphic images that separated themselves from most of the art that covered the walls. They were distinct pieces crafted in minutes, he would just walk into a subway car after completing the pieces and went on to find another makeshift street or subway canvas repeatedly in the late 70s and early 80s. They were distinct pieces crafted in minutes, and Keith would just walk into a subway car after completing the pieces. This movement with the predominantly black creative community in Uptown, and the mostly white downtown that were doing a lot of the same stuff, became an alternative public art form. 
going against the marketable and elitist art that most aspire to. Why is he drawing babies and why is he drawing dogs? It's for you. Thank you.